Good morning and welcome all. Greetings from beautiful Puerto Rico. I'm Armando Valdez, a local broadcast radio personality. Thank you all for joining us today for an important conversation in the travel and tourism space. With quite the experience in crisis management and recovery from hurricanes to political unrest, earthquakes and more, our local destination marketing organization, Discover Puerto Rico, is providing a platform to share learnings with the industry because we believe we are stronger together. The experts joining me today will discuss their respective learnings and perspectives as we look to the future. We have a wonderful group of leaders in the industry joining us today, and I'd like to introduce them now. First of all, Ann Madison, Senior Vice President, Global Marketing and Strategic Communications at Cruise Lines International Association, CLIA. Don Welsh, President and CEO of Destinations International. Diana Plazas Trowbridge, Chief Sales and Marketing Officer, Caribbean and Latin America for Marriott International. Jose Peco Suarez, Board of Directors Chairman for Discover Puerto Rico, and Manuel Lavoy, Executive Director of Puerto Rico's Central Office of Reconstruction, Recovery and Resilience, and also a former Secretary for Economic Development. Let's drive right in. I'd first love to hear about crisis preparedness. While nothing really could have prepared us for COVID-19, there are undoubtedly some experiences that gave us a glimpse into what would be needed. I'd love to hear from Anne, Diana, and Jose on how cruises, hotels, and destinations took past experiences to help guide the way. Let's start with Anne from CLIA. Okay, thank you so much. Well, you know, one of the things that I have said throughout my career is that you never let a good crisis go to waste, and I just love a good crisis. I think I may have said it too often. I've been involved in a lot of them, and um, while it's a, it, it's a, a very um, experiential and uh, building on experience kind of time for you, um, nothing um, could have prepared us for what has happened um, over the past year. I can tell you that what prepared me the most, however, was the uh, culmination of all of those experiences. A lot of people looked at SARS and other things and said, well, since it's in the same category, wouldn't that be something that prepared you for this? But I'll tell you, the best thing that we had going for us was scenario planning over the course of many, many years. Because regardless of how up to date your crisis manual is, without that scenario planning and debriefing after crises to be able to enhance and build upon those learnings, you, you really have nothing. And so I would say that the, the totality of the experiences, debriefing on them and building out scenario plans for uh, expecting the unexpected is probably uh, the best experience that we had. Deanna? As similar to, uh, for us to Anne's perspective, I think that coronavirus obviously has been the most significant and probably the most traumatic experience that we've gone through um, personal lives and professionally. And although we can see a little bit of the end at the end of the tunnel, we are still in the middle of it in a lot of the markets. As a company, we went through the market crashes of 20, 2008, 2009, 9-11. Um, and obviously, as you mentioned, you know, earthquakes, ECA, political unrest, everything. So we have some pretty set up crisis protocols and plans and everything that we were able to leverage. And knowing that we also had the support from our global teams, I think seeing the fact that this crisis started in China in December, January of 2020, being able to start seeing the impact they were having, how they were addressing it, how are they reacting to it, and being able to then also share some of their best practices, how they were closing down the hotels, reopening the hotels, working with the local communities, et cetera. I think really leveraging that, but also the crisis toolkits that we've had over decades of uh, working in this region really is what came into action, but knowing that we also had to adjust in many areas and we continue to have to adjust to it since we hadn't had anything to this scale and to this scope before. So hopefully now with vaccine rollouts and everything, it's now also new experiences that we're having because of those rollouts and as part of the recovery that we're able to now add in case of any future challenges as well. We'll say, how about you? Well, as uh, our CEO, Brad Dean, likes to say, Puerto Rico has a PhD in resiliency. Uh, this is a degree that we've earned after going through, as, as Armando mentioned in the introduction, after going through Hurricane Maria, political unrest, uh, earthquakes uh, prior to COVID. Uh, there were key areas we leaned into. Uh, number one, creating a robust 
crisis preparedness playbook with our partners at our public relations agency, Ketchum, before COVID-19 arose. Uh, this allowed us to have clearly identified team members to address various issues and the initial steps in place to address both current and future visitors, as well as immediate concerns with the appropriate government ent entities. The importance of enhancing communication with local key partners uh, was made clear to us as we tackled the various crises mentioned before. I mean, COVID start, we met on a weekly basis with the Puerto Rico's uh, health department, uh, an agency that was obviously is key to understanding the status of the virus. The airport, uh, uh, Aerostar, the airport uh, uh, manager, uh, which monitors incoming passengers and the processes in place. And of course, the Puerto Rico tourism company who manages the visitor's experience and works with the local government to develop measures in place for those visiting the island. So establishing open and constant communication with key stakeholders has been crucial to our success. And, and certainly some of these things have clearly uh, worked uh, to think that just shy of two years after Hurricane Maria Puerto Rico was breaking record numbers in terms of uh, the tourism industry is, is certainly a statement to uh, what many of you have done and what Discover Puerto Rico has been able to do. And it, it's also fascinating to think about all the rather unorthodox and strange things we've been pushed uh, to do this past year. Uh, the travel and tourism industry has certainly been uh, one of uh, the most impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as we look back, I'd love to hear from uh, Don and Manuel, who manage quite robust entities in their own respect, what they felt was the single most important tactic that they worked on with their teams with its future impact in mind. Don, let's start with you. Well, good morning, buenos dias. It's, uh, it's always great to be with uh, my friends in Puerto Rico. This, I think, is the longest I've gone without seeing a lot of you in person. So uh, I do wish you well in the recovery. You know, I'm, uh, I'm proud of a lot of things that our industry did. Uh, I think Diana and Anne uh, really articulated that we've never seen anything like this before. You know, we've actually used uh, Puerto Rico in the last four to five years as, the, as, as an example of how you recover from natural disasters. We then worked with our friends in Las Vegas after the shooting there to figure out how do you how do you work from something like an act of terrorism. But uh, we've never had anything such a, as a global pandemic that was the, really the flattener across the board. So I think we just all had to figure out ways to uh, serve our members, serve our partners. Uh, we were all adjusting to a new norm. Our team went from 30 people to 15. But I honestly think between the leadership that took place with people such as Brad and around the world, um, we, we've, we've, we've really figured out that communication and adaptability and responding with real and relevant and timely information, Armando, was probably the best thing we could do. So <clears throat> I'm proud of the fact within that March to December time period, we actually did 64 webinars. And they were on every host of, uh, you know, whatever the, the needed information was for that week, we did something. So I think it just showed that when we pulled all the resources together as an industry, we did some pretty special things. So I'll say that, uh, you know, pivoting and adapting to the opportunity is something we've done. And I know that, again, Brad and his team have done the same. Manuel? Uh, Manuel, can you hear us? Oh, you're you're on mute. That that always happens. It always happens. Even it after had you. to happen to someone. <laughs> um, so different to other other places, other destinations. In the case of Puerto Rico, when we started the COVID nineteen pandemic in March twenty twenty, we were actually dealing with, <clears throat> with the earthquakes of the south, and we're still also dealing with the recovery of of the hurricane uh, from twenty seventeen. So I think that in the case of Puerto Rico, uh, when it comes down to managing disasters, uh, Peco mentioned uh, PhD, well, let's not take that lightly because it's not only in a short period of time, in, in basically three years, having a hundred year uh, storm, basically a hundred year earthquake, and then this pandemic that was impacting not only Puerto Rico, but the globe, really reshape things the way we see it in the island uh, in terms of really addressing the needs of the people of Puerto Rico in that context. Not only because of the short period of time, 
but also the nature, the characteristic of a disaster. Each one is completely different. Now, in the case of COVID-19, we made a very tough decision back in March, which was to proactively lock down the island and, and establish a curfew. We were one of the first jurisdictions in the US to actually do that. So when I reflect back on that, uh, the, the single most important tactic was how to maintain focus in a period that was basically full of uncertainty. And for first time in, in our modern history, we needed to lock down the economy, essentially, manage this health crisis that you know very soon become, became also an economic crisis. So maintaining that balance between the health and the economy in a period of great uncertainty, the, the, the fact that we're also dealing with other disasters basically at the same time, well, I will say that maintaining that focus, and I also heard communication a couple of times in this past five minutes, discussing maintaining a direct communication with the industry, with the stakeholders, with the communities, with the business owners, you know, it was essential. But I have to stress the fact that uncertainty was something that I don't think we ever seen before. In the case of Puerto Rico, it was even greater because we also managing other disasters as well. So focus and the capacity to really communicate in, in a situation that we never, never seen before. I also think it's been interesting how the DMO has been able to create, craft, and really communicate a narrative about recovery, about Puerto Rico being a place that is bouncing back and it's bouncing back better. Uh, and I think that that's an attractive narrative for a lot of people. They want to participate in something that that is that is building back uh, to make something uh, that's really quite unique and quite special. Uh, and now, and regarding the cruise ship industry specifically, I, I think that uh, it, it, there's some parallels there between what Puerto Rico faced, again, uh, three uh, years ago with uh, Hurricane Maria three or four years ago and what the cruise ship industry is going to have to do now to rebuild uh, because of everything that, that has happened with the pandemic. So, Anne, I'd, I'd love to hear from you a little bit more about how CLIA is working with DMOs to create effective strategies as we look to the future to really bring back cruising and to bring back uh, the impact, the positive impact that it has on a lot of destinations across the world. Yeah, thank you so much. You know, everything that we're doing is really about reputation, regulation, and legislation, more so than at any other time. But cruise lines and destinations share a special bond. Um, and that they, in this health crisis, but in anything, but particularly in this health crisis, you know, uh, cruise lines and destinations have a shared commitment to safeguarding the health of um, visitors, passengers, in, in the case of cruise lines, you've got crew on board, um, and the people in the destinations where the cruise ships visit. So it's really, really important, it's been very important that the um, cruise lines and the destinations work together. They have to work together not only in being in lockstep on messaging and the approach, um, but also that any kind of resumption has to be holistic. So it has, we know from this crisis that everything has to be informed by science and medicine. Um, it has to be subject to the rules and regulations of the, of the destinations that the cru cruise lines visit. And when I say holistic, it's not just in terms of the science and the medicine and, and a cruise ship arriving and departing, but also that door-to-door -door stra strategy. So having the protocols in place and agreeing upon that. That's been very, very important. Thank you, Anne. Uh, my uh, final question, and I do want to uh, alert our viewers, we will be uh, taking questions uh, from all of you. You can feel free to type in in the Q&A box in the webinar uh, functionality of Zoom, and I'll be uh, looking through the questions and uh, presenting them to our uh, panelists live here on the webinar. So feel free to start uh, putting in those questions into the Q&A. But uh, my final question is two part and I'm gonna uh, present this to all the panelists. Uh, I know the audience and myself are eager to know what changes brought about by COVID will remain in your organization's day to day and what your best advice for those in the industry would be. And, and not just things that have changed in your organization, but trends that you think 
the industry should be aware of that perhaps accelerate it because of the pandemic or that have dramatically shifted because of the pandemic and uh, the consumer habits of tourists as we enter this recovery stage in the COVID-19 pandemic. So let's start with Anne. I just had to unmute myself there. Um, I think that there are a lot of things. Um, I will first talk about in the terms of the way we approach crisis communications. Um, anyone who knows me knows that I've said that um, in media training and otherwise, you never go off the record. And in fact, um, I won't say how old I am, but it's um, several decades. Um, of experience. And one of the things I always said, don't go off the record, don't go off the record. And in my entire career, I've gone off the record twice until this, until this crisis. And I'm keeping track. I'm keeping track of two things. How many times I've been out of the house, actually in a car and gone someplace, um, but also how many times I'm, I've gone off the record. And I've gone off the record now 42 times. It is, I never, ever, ever expected that I would do that. But I say that because um, it's the doing it at the right time at the right place for the right reasons. And the right reasons have to be because it is to educate and inform, not to defend. Um, and it is um, at the right place with those trusted media that you've built up um, a, a relationship with over time. And always keeping in mind that even though you've built up those relationships with media, the media is still not your audience. They're a channel to your audience. So that will continue. Um, going off the record is probably something that I'll continue to do, but always, always, always for the right reasons. The other thing is ongoing research. And one of the things that we put in place right away was to uh, increase the frequency of uh, sentiment tracking so that we knew what were our messages resonating, were our actions resonating. And the other one was to look at economic data. Um, prior to this, um, the cruise line industry was really only tracking economic data maybe once um, every other year, um, in some cases every three years, that made no sense. And, uh, and the timing again is everything. So at the beginning of it, we immediately put in place to track the economic impact of the suspension of cruise and to know when to utilize that data. We knew it wasn't right to use it at the beginning when because it would have been seen as tone deaf. Um, and my last comment I'd say we'll put in place is you've got to, I'll use the, the ship analogy of staying the course. It is really, really difficult when you're in an industry that is such high profile, particularly uh, you know, travel is very high profile, but it's particularly high profile for cruise lines. And so we had to learn not to be hurt by what was say, being said by certain people um, or in the media or in editorials. And because sometimes, and this is a learning, sometimes the loudest voices do not represent the majority of people. And I'd say that that is true nine out of 10 times. And so we were able to, by staying the course, staying positive, being proactive, uh, not, we were not then distracted by the naysayers. You're not gonna change those hearts and minds. You have to find out which hearts and minds you do need to change and make sure that you know you're doing the right thing at the right time uh, in order to get to the objectives that you set out at the very beginning. Thank you so much, Ann. That, that, that is very important. You do have to understand who you actually need to speak to. Uh, and obviously reaching out to consumers and understanding their needs is very important, particularly in this uh, crisis that the tourism industry has faced. Uh, Don, what about you from the perspective of Destinations International and uh, DMOs across the world? Well, well, first of all, I thought what Ann said was really, really relevant and timely. I, I think what, what we learned is that, number one, when there's time of crisis or uncertainty, people are looking for, for leadership. They're looking for direction. They're looking for the tools and resources they need to get through their day. And I applaud Jose and Brad and the team, because I don't think there's a, a, a day that goes by, I don't get something from Discover Puerto Rico in terms of its messaging to its stakeholders. We, we have done that on a broader level. So I think, you know, your, part of your question was, what have we learned? I think we've learned that technology can be used, it can be used effectively. Uh, well, I know we've probably all gotten to the point where we've got Zoom fatigue or web, uh, web webinar fatigue, but nonetheless, it's a very effective way to communicate. 
I think the, the, the benefits that, that Puerto Rico will have, number one, you are resilient. You, you probably lead the world in resiliency. So when the timing is right and Manuel turns the faucet back on and everything is right from a city arrival standpoint, here's the great thing that you all understand, that number one, you've got the infrastructure, you've got wonderful facilities, you've got world-class hotels, you've got adequate lift coming into your market. It seems to be growing every year. So I think when the opportunity is right and the vaccine does continue to accelerate its uh, its its process. Love the fact that uh, President Biden has now said, let's let's get this country and this uh, this tourism economy up and running in May and June. So hopefully by summer comes around. But I think we've learned a lot. And I've been saying this since uh, I've been in this industry. Nothing can replace the real experience of travel. And when people feel as though it's safe for them and their families to travel, they will come back. Um, and, and I think nothing can replace, you know, the, I, I've said travel is part of the human DNA. And I don't think it's ever been, you know, truer than it is now. The funniest thing about where we were in the darkest days of the pandemic, people were still planning to take their trips, even, as, even though, and Diana's nodding because she knows Mary, I probably picked up on this. They knew probably the trip was going to be canceled. But I think it transports our mind to places such as this picture we're looking at right now. And I do think when the opportunity is right, Puerto Rico is going to be well served and uh, and ready to go, and and I know Ann can't wait to get those ships going back in and out of the port as well. So, uh, I think we've learned a lot, and we will we will keep a lot of that learning that we've had. And Don, that that is a great point. I think that Discover Puerto Rico was very effective at the height of the pandemic, keeping Puerto Rico top of mind, reminding people about what they loved about Puerto Rico because people were planning those trips. Uh, and are dreaming about that trip they'll take uh, when they're able to travel again. And so I think that the Discover Puerto Rico has been very effective uh, doing that during the pandemic. Uh, Diana, from the perspective of the uh, hospitality industry, uh, Marriott International, uh, let's hear from you. Yeah, so I definitely agree with what Don and what Anna have said in regards to kind of what we look at in the future and uh, the advice that we can share. but. Really, for us, in the way that we conduct our day to day, one of the big things, and again, Ann mentioned it, it's the communication piece. I think that because cleanliness and safety and all of the new protocols have become the new luxury, how we communicate that to the guests, then again, back to the point of Discover Puerto Rico, just being so transparent with customers about like these are the protocols, this is what you need to do before, this is what you would do during, etc. Like, those are things that are going to completely be with us moving forward. Same thing with some of the new digital tools that we're using, how we're leveraging our mobile app even more. All of that is here for us to, with, to stay. And we really need to make sure that we're continuing to hear from the customer, continuing to hear from our hotels on how the operation on property continues to evolve as we welcome more guests, as we are continuing to try and manage the social distancing, enforcing masks, et cetera, and how we continue to communicate that through every channel possible to whether it's a Marriott Bonvoy member or a local guest or whoever it may be, as well as with the press. In regards to advice, really, again, travel is an incredibly resilient industry, and we we're talking about it like people continue to dream about travel all through this pandemic, and we would see the big surges of travel even our team in the UK were sharing with us some stats as soon as they announced that release in regards to their travel for July. The spike that we saw immediately for those dates was just incredible because people are eager to get back out there to explore the world or go back to their favorite place, go back to their favorite beach. So it just really staying in that top of mind with the customer, whether it's just inspiring them reminding them, them of the great activities or great experiences that they can have when they visit one of these locations and really collaborating also with the DMOs, collaborating with the governments, with other companies in the private sector, making sure that we're really providing those holistic solutions as it pertains to travel, providing the comfort, the confidence in the traveler to do that again, and really knowing that we also may have to be 
more flexible and more, more nimble as we continue this journey of recovery, as we continue to see how some things have now again changed forever, making sure that you don't go back to this is how we did things two years ago, because I think definitely it is a new world of travel. And again, we know people are wanting to travel. We're seeing the numbers in Puerto Rico for sure right now. We're seeing the numbers in many of our Caribbean and Mexico destinations. So it's just how we continue to take those learnings and continue to adjust and not think that we have to go back to how things were done before. Thank you, Diana. Um, and we still have uh, Peco, Jose Suarez, and Manuel, and I just want to remind you of the question. I know it's been a little while since I uh, presented it, but we're looking for uh, how your organization's day-to-day -day has changed, what your best advice for the industry is, and how you're adapting to these changing uh, trends in the tourism industry that have been brought about uh, by, by changing consumer habits and, and consumer demand. Uh, uh, Jose? You, you are on mute. I'm doing great. I was, uh, my video was off in the first question and now I was on mute in the second one. <laughs> Hopefully we'll get better from now on. Um, but at Discover, I think we've learned uh, that data rules. That's been the biggest uh, thing that we've learned. Uh, more than ever, we're leaning into data to let it guide us day in and day out. Uh, data dictates all, including our marketing. It's basically the guiding light of our multi-phase campaign called It's Time, which was designed to keep Puerto Rico top of mind during the COVID-19 times. The concept revolved around time and uh, first reminded travelers that as much as they wanted to host them, we knew it wasn't the right time. It is through data that we can pivot to all in good time and it's time. We're also using very strategic methods create, created with data to target responsible travelers via marketing, evaluating findings, surrounding sentiment in order to cater to the needs of future travelers in a COVID environment and everything in between. Uh, in terms of advice, uh, uh, my biggest uh, piece of advice, actually Diana touched on it for those in the, in the industry is to look to the future with transparency. Uh, there has never been a more critical time to transparently communicate how to enter a destination. For example, what's in place locally. We at uh, Discover Puerto Rico are travelers also, and we understand the need for these. There should be no surprises. We have made a big effort to clearly outline the measures in place locally, all developed to keep residents and travelers safe with communications on our website and via social for travelers to be aware. Thank you, Jose. And uh, last but not least, Manuel Lavoy. I will share basically uh, three lessons, Armando. Um, the first one is that we're humans. At the end of the day, this affected us at a very personal level, despite of our professions and despite our role responsibilities. I remember last year when I was dealing with the pandemic uh, in my former role, I also needed to do homeschooling. So while we were facing all these challenges, it doesn't matter whether you are, you know, at whatever position in your organization or whether you are at leadership, we also needed to face personal challenges. My son is in college, so he needed to graduate, you know, his last year virtually. And my daughter that's in fifth grade, I had to do a lot of homeschooling last year. So adapting to that circumstance was not easy. So we need to remind ourselves that at the bottom, we are humans and this is going to affect us at a very personal level. So how do we move forward? Uh, with our routines, this is going to be very interesting. Uh, and actually, I have a friend. He is a, a consultant that he took his family a couple of months ago. He just went to the states, and he's been working from the states. And their kids are going and doing homeschooling from the states, and they're actually doing a lot of tourism in the states altogether. You couldn't do that, you know, years ago. So there is kind of some lessons on that regard. Number one, number two, in my current role, I am responsible of disimbursing billions of dollars billions of dollars for recovery in the next couple of years. But I have to also remind myself that there's going to be probably a next disaster. That is the reality that we're living. There's going to be a next disaster. We don't know when, we don't know the shape or form, but we need to understand that regardless, this lesson has put us in a position for continuity, whether it is at the destination level, whether it's at a business level, whether it's at a personal level, continuity. And number three, I will say that I think Puerto Rico is very lucky. We have discovered Puerto Rico, 
you know, it, it, this, you know, was a project that started about three, four years ago. And in very short period of time, Discover Puerto Rico and its leadership, especially our CEO, uh, Brad Dean, they have to go through the toughest of the challenges. I don't think there's any destination that has to go through all these challenges in, in this period. So now we have probably the most equipped DMO in the world, I will say. I'm very confident to say that. The most equipped with the lessons learned, with the tools, with the experience, with the knowledge to get us to the next phase in the destination of Puerto Rico in terms of tourism and growing you know, tourism. But we gotta do it mindfully because there's gonna be disasters in the future. What better DMO that we can have and what better leadership are the board directors of Discover Puerto Rico and our CEO, Brad Dean, to get us you know, navigating through those times because we have probably the best uh, you know, equipped system and equipped, you know, a set of, of, of lessons learned, you know, in the industry, probably in the world. Thank you very much, Manuel. And thank you to all of our panelists for uh, participating in this first part of the webinar. Let's go to the Q&A. We've got a lot of great questions. We still have uh, time for you to enter your questions in the Q&A functionality on the webinar. Uh, let's start with uh, Anne. Kalash, and I'm going to throw this question over to um, to Ann Madison from uh, CLIA. Uh, Ann would like to hear about uh, the cruise task force established in, between the Florida Caribbean uh, Cruise Association and the Caribbean. Uh, what's happening with that? Is it developing uniform protocols or other action items? Uh, hi, Ann. It's uh, nice to see you on this webinar. Um, you know, the Caribbean, um, uh, the America's Caribbean um, task force that was put together is a very important one. And it really speaks to the uh, coordination and the holistic approach between cruise lines, destinations, ports, health authorities. I think it's probably the best example of a um, coordinated process. Um, between industry and destinations. And the th that task force is continuing. It continues on its course of making sure that providing the best possible care and prioritization of uh, the destination. So the passengers, the crew, and the people um, that are the residents and workers within a destination. Um, a lot of work is being done in terms of the areas of, of health um, from and that really support the holistic approach that's being done in other areas of the world. And I think it's really gonna help um, the Caribbean quite a bit. Um, I, th I think it will serve as a model for other areas. There's a lot of great learnings and a lot of great models out there, but this one is probably the most holistic because it goes from embarkation and testing to what happens on board to um, how do you interface with medical and public health authorities to what happens for, for example, think about shore excursions. All of these kinds of things are very, very critical. And what has been put in place by the cruise line industry are about 75, 76, maybe 80 protocols. Some of those will continue. Um, but the great thing about this, these protocols and the policy has been that it was designed to evolve as the pandemic evolves. Um, and in coordination, not in a vacuum, but in coordination with the destination. So I would say that the, um, uh, the task force for the Caribbean um, with the cruise line is uh, something that I think a lot of industries, even outside of travel, can really use as a model uh, and learnings for uh, their own businesses. Thank you so much, Ann. Um, I'm going to throw this next question over to Diana Plazas and to uh, Jose Suarez from Discover Puerto Rico. Uh, Lydia Gregory writes in, what does the recovery look like specifically for the meetings, incentives, conventions, uh, and exhibitors, exhibitions, uh, tourism segment. Yeah, so we have seen some interest obviously starting to come up and a lot of work around hybrid meetings, which has been really great to see. And in particular in Puerto Rico, I actually got some numbers from our team there um, at some of our hotels and the volume of hybrid meetings that we've been doing. Again, just really rethinking our spaces and providing the confidence to the meeting planners on how we're gonna be handling the food and beverage, how we're gonna be handling the actual meeting space, the group. So there's been a lot of communication, a lot of engagement, a lot of work in regards to 
our um, meeting with confidence and ensuring that our partners are really well versed in what we can do, but also with our hotels on adjusting the work that they do and what they had been working on from a meetings perspective and mice perspective. So again, I think that we're not definitely seeing the volume today that you would think that around meetings and but we are starting to see some more interest in future years and continue to just again work with our hotels go work with our partners work with the planners understand what are some of their key concerns or key requirements and how we can deliver on that on property we'll see and you are again on mute the my segment is actually one of the one that gives us the most hope uh, going forward uh, we are excited. Uh, we have tremendous results in our uh, bookings in our in our books to, to be uh, some redundant. Uh, the uh, pace uh, that we our numbers are reflecting is is very positive. There's been a lot of interest uh, to look at Puerto Rico for meetings in the future. And I think there's a number of factors uh, that uh, benefit us. Uh, number one, uh, I think as a destination or as an island. Uh, we, uh, the locals really took it very seriously when it came to uh, controlling uh, the virus. Uh, we, we as Latins tend to be, tend to not follow rules too much, uh, but somehow in Puerto Rico, I think we have to give uh, credit to the government. They really educated the locals and people have really followed the rules contrary to our nature. Uh, and that has resulted in controlling the virus and that has resulted also in one of the highest vaccination rates if any destination in the US. So that translates into hopefully giving confidence to the meeting planners and to the people book, uh, booking business into the future that Puerto Rico has things under control. The airport has gained some uh, accreditations that are that reflect uh, the high level of, of uh, control that we have over the virus. Uh, our convention center is obviously, uh, has also gained uh, uh, the, the needed ratings in terms of controlling the, the virus and, and, and sanitation. So we are definitely ready uh, to welcome groups um, in, in, in the short term. And on the positive side, the bookings are really reflecting that Puerto Rico is a desired destination. Thank you so much, Peco. Uh, our next question comes from uh, Ingrid Cotto with El Sentinel Orlando. Um, I'm going to throw this one over to Manuel as a representative of the government of Puerto Rico. Uh, how are you uh, balancing enforcing COVID-19 restrictions and regulations such as mandatory masks for tourists uh, that um, are not using the requirement while keeping a balance on attractive destinations and the prevention of another spike in cases? Well, there's a couple of things I'd like to share about that. Number one, I think that the message from last year and has been the message today is that Puerto Rico uh, it wants to be, and I think is a safe destination. So the marketing that has been going out by Discover Puerto Rico is, is a message to attract you know, responsible travels that we want responsible and we want to ensure that we come to Puerto Rico, you're going to enjoy everything that we can offer as a destination, but we got to do it following the rules and it has to be safe. Now, of course, in this uh, situation that we're living in, you know, there's going to be many challenges. And you just mentioned it very well, you know, it's also about enforcement. So we got to make sure, and there's been already, you know, uh, task forces between different agencies uh, from the government, you know, from, from the safety, law and order, from tourism, and business community, uh, municipalities, working together, you know, and putting together a number of strategies uh, to ensure that Come to Puerto Rico, but you gotta, you know, follow the rules. And if not, there's gonna be some consequences, you know. And and this is shouldn't be the exception here. It has to be everywhere. This has to be in Puerto Rico. Whether you're visiting another destination, it has to be based on, you know, the rules that have are being set because it's really for the safety on, you know, for the visitors and it's the safety of the people of Puerto Rico. So I think that uh, it, we're not alone. There's been some challenges in other in other places. When it comes down to Puerto Rico, I think there were some adjustments that were made at the government level, and those tactics, in my perspective, you know, are actually you know, uh, giving us good results. Thank you so much, Manuel. Uh, Ingrid Cotto from El Sentinel Orlando uh, does have uh, another question, and I'm going to throw this one over to Jose, Jose Suarez uh, Peco. Uh, how are you attracting tourists with businesses, restaurants, and attractions closed? Is there a guide as to what is open and 
what visitors can expect in terms of COVID-19 rules versus things they can do and places to visit. I, I would add just as someone who actually lives in Puerto Rico, I'm not quite sure, and maybe I'll add this to the question, I'm not quite sure how much of the tourism infrastructure is, is to some degree uh, open. Uh, Jose? Um, well, uh, let me start by saying that we learned uh, as a destination back uh, during Maria times uh, to uh, make the public aware of what was closed and what was open. So from back then, the tourism company started um, uh, publishing in their website uh, what was closed and what was open because obviously the impact that Maria had on the island. So we have, we have applied that to the current crisis. Most of the businesses in Puerto Rico are open. However, we do have um, special hours. Some businesses are closing earlier and, and uh, there's some limitations based on the executive orders that are implemented by the governor. So those are constantly communicated in the Discover Puerto Rico page and in the Puerto Rico tourism page. Uh, and those are constantly changing depending on the uh, upcoming executive order by the governor related to COVID. Um, and they, visitors should expect an island where everybody's wearing a mask. Uh, there's no, no exception. You know, people are following the rules down here. And if you, we invite you to go to Puerto Rico, well, we invite you to follow the rules and have fun and enjoy our island, but following the rules. It's as simple as that. And, and Jose, just to not, not leave that question on the table. Do you know how much of our tourism infrastructure is open versus what's closed? I know yeah, there's some key, what's open has most, some but. yeah, there's some major attractions that have recently opened uh, in, in the last couple of months. El Yunque Rainforest opened uh, months ago. Um, the uh, famous uh, El Morro Fort also reopened to the public months ago. Uh, an important um, uh, destination on the west coast of the island, the famous Camuy Caves, recently reopened uh, just a few weeks ago. So most of the major destinations are uh, have been opened or are in the process of being opened. There's a few other destinations that uh, related to Hurricane Maria Damage are still not open, but most of the island is available uh, for the enjoyment uh, of the public. Uh, something very important for, for months, we had access to the beaches uh, closed by the government again, with, uh, related to prevention of COVID transmission. Uh, for months now, our beaches are open to the public. All San Juan, all the major attractions are available for our visitors to enjoy with, uh, again, by following the rules. Thank you, Jose. Um, this question is for Don. What's your personal outlook on travel and when it'll truly come back to what it once was domestically and, and the... Uh, uh, person would like uh, to know a timeline. I know that that's kind of a, a tough question, but just a general timeline of when we could expect uh, to that, uh, that to return to normal. Great question. We looked at some data, as a matter of fact, as early as this morning. Um, and the um, if you look at more or less the leisure, the domestic leisure, which again is uh, very important for Puerto Rico, it is already begun. I'm sure Diana can say that uh, in terms of demand in hotels, it is starting to take place. Um, you know, I've actually been able to travel. And, and again, uh, as Jose says, I travel with my mask. I, I'm responsible, but I've been in plenty of destinations right now where business is coming back. So um, if you look at the leisure numbers, the leisure numbers are actually predicted to be at the 2019 levels pre-COVID in the 22 level. If you look at the business traveler, which I read about this morning, that person that in many gateway cities is very important. That is lagging a little bit further behind because until uh, there's liability issues the corporations deal with and people get back in their offices and there is just a little bit of return to quote normalcy, that's a segment that's not looking to come back until 23 or 24. The furthest segment coming back is, and by the way, I'm, I'm glad you, you talked about the importance of the mice market for uh, Puerto Rico. Um, we're already seeing that as again, we're seeing in hotel partners our convention viewers around the country are actually trying to accommodate the demand of planners now that are actually, you know, in the position where they can book a meeting. So in places like Houston, they're coming back strong. And of course, throughout Florida and throughout uh, areas that have sort of opened up. And uh, again, that's predicted to come back uh, in the 22, 23 era strong. The longest segment that's out right now is the international traveler. 
the person that's, you know, been used to coming in long haul destinations and until, you know, borders reopen and airplanes get back in the uh, the air and some of the inducements like uh, cruise lines for them, some of these people to connect with, that is probably predicted to be in the 24, 25 stage. But the good news is I think of all the leisure opportunities for Puerto Rico, it's it's happening now. And as we get into the, the May and uh, in the summer months, it will accelerate. Thank you, Don. Uh, this question actually is for uh, Ann Madison, linking up with what you were just talking about uh, on the cruise line front. Uh, obviously, Puerto Rico is a great hub for the rest of the Caribbean for cruises. With people now thinking hard about their upcoming trips, how much do you believe, if at all, people will be vacationing before or after in cruise port cities now more than ever to make the most out of their cruise trip? Uh, do you see a rise in this happening in the post-COVID world? So pre and post uh, destination travel in that uh, major uh, cruise port where people land and, and take their take their cruise ship. Uh, Anne? So thanks for that question. Um, one of the greatest things about um, if you can find a good silver lining in all of this is that is the pent up demand for travel and the coordination again that we've talked about with destinations. Uh, we need to expand this to all the different verticals. Uh, but I can tell you that, you know, CLIA has the largest um, base of travel agents and certainly the largest base of travel agents that are focused solely on or predominantly on cruise. And one of the things that we're seeing, and I believe is gonna be a continuing trend, is this, this strength of the desire to travel. Cause as Don says, you know, that, that just doesn't go away. This is, a, this is something that people are going to, um, you, know, you can't replace that experience. And one of the things that I believe is the trend that we're seeing or hearing from our travel agents is that people want to now plan the ultimate type of 360 degree experience. So what happens before that trip, um, before they board and what happens afterwards? And we've seen slowly and steadily an increase in the amount of money that people are spending before and after on a cruise ship. Um, uh, so that is adding to an increased impact on uh, the economic benefits of travel and particularly it's cr the cruise contribution. So I think that you're gonna see more marketing related to that. I think you're also going to see a lot more coordination that happens because of the health protocols that are simply going to have to stay in place. This is not a once and done pandemic. This is a pandemic that is going to change the face of travel. I think in many, um, in many ways, very many good ways. Uh, for that. And the other great thing about cruise is that you, you find that people go on a cruise. It's not just that, just like it's not just a once and done vacation. It's a holiday that inspires them to come back and actually go to the destinations that they visited and really take a deeper experience. So when you look at the economic impact and the coordination that needs to happen to maximize that economic impact, it's not just about that moment in time from the cruise itself, but what happens after Afterwards, and not just immediately afterwards, but in the years that follow. There are so many marketing opportunities once people um, embark from a, a destination or visit it along their itinerary on a cruise ship to be able to market to them to have them come back. And that's, uh, that's something that I think that destinations have a great opportunity. I think the other destination opportunity here is that this pandemic has created a reset moment. So where it was that very large um, and um, large funded destinations had the ability to really, you know, get a greater share of voice and uh, in reaching travelers international and throughout um, even the domestic market, that this is a reset moment that now everybody's kind of starting anew. People are going to be looking for places where they can have authentic experiences, even more so than they did before. And they're gonna to want to know that there is safety in the protocols in place in that destination. And I believe that the lure of the big destinations will still continue, but there's also a certain safety in the, um, in the the smaller destinations that have not been able to really compete with the big ones. So I think that there's a huge opportunity and we're seeing it happening in the conversations with travel agents and we really need to formalize this. We need to formalize the coordination that happens before, during and after a cruise um, vacation. And that coordination needs to continue, not just in the moment, but in the years that follow. Thank you, Ann. Uh, Pickle, we have a question for you from one of our attendees. 
the question reads, I have been seeing a lot in the press about Puerto Rico and the great handling of the COVID situation. What's going to be Puerto Rico's focus to keep that momentum going? Well, I think uh, vaccinations uh, are key. Uh, in fact, uh, I'll give you an example. Today, right next to me uh, uh, at the convention center, we have today 10,000 persons, 10,000 persons being vaccinated. And these are food and beverage, mainly food and beverage uh, personnel, restaurant personnel uh, being vaccinated today. Uh, so I, I think that's going to be key for us as an island to, to reach the, the famous uh, herd immunity that everybody talks about. I think we, we, we are in the right track. And uh, continuing to communicate properly to our visitors that we want you to visit, but we want you to follow the rules and be responsible and be a responsible traveler. Uh, as long as we do that, you can still come to Puerto Rico and have a great time right now. Um, you know, there's still some restrictions, you know, restaurants and, and bars are still closed. Uh, restaurants uh, have a curfew of uh, an 11 o'clock shutdown. I think as, as things improve, that's going to be continue to, to be uh, expanded, the opening hours. Uh, mm -hmm. But you, you, you can come to Puerto Rico and, and you see daily people uh, having a great time on the island, even within the restrictions that we have implemented in place. Thank you so much. So if I can chime in a little bit oh, on that, course, yeah. um, just because it's been interesting to see and just hearing the perspective. And I know Peco and Don know from a lot of our meetings on Discover Puerto Rico, we would always talk about the, you know, the mainland US traveler that wouldn't go to Puerto Rico. And it's been great to actually see now how many more visitors we're having, how many more, from our perspective at least, how many guests we're having in Puerto Rico that never consider the island and are getting a chance to now actually go and explore it because of all the limitations in other markets. Like Grand Cayman remains completely closed. So many others have major, you know, testing requirements, quarantine requirements. So seeing all of those travelers that didn't consider the destination before and are now getting a chance to see it and enjoy everything that the market has to offer, I think it's how we continue to communicate with them to really keep that momentum going to the question that uh, Pekka was answering. I think it's just, how do we ensure that we continue to attract more of that, um, that traveler that never considered it before and how they can now actually see even more of the island and keep them coming even more. Thank you, Diana. Um, I'm gonna uh, present one last question for all of our panelists. We have a few minutes, so uh, if you could please be brief, but I think this question was really, uh, quite astute. Uh, the, the question is, how do you communicate that a crisis is over and that things can return to normal? I think that's that's something that all of us are looking forward to. What are the milestones? How, how do we determine, hey, this is the time when I can say we're back to what uh, we had before? And perhaps the answer will be, well, we'll never be able to say that. Maybe Maybe there's no going back to what we had before. What, what do you all think? Let's start with uh, with Don. Well, first of all, you've got a, you've got a great crisis person in the Ann on the on the call today. But I'll I'll say from from my standpoint, there's a couple of things. One, I think we all know right now this this entire pandemic, COVID, has been very personal. So I believe right now, when people feel as though for themselves and their family on their timeline. That's when normalcy will happen for them and they'll get back to travel. And that's gonna be whether for that leisure trip, for that business travel or a meeting, you won't be able to force that. And I think everybody understands. So getting back Armando to your question about, you know, the previous times, I think we're gonna be in a period of time where it's gonna take a couple of years for people to sort of settle in and find out what's right for them. So I, I, I think that uh, people re will rediscover it. And the nicest thing is, uh, one of the, the great things about Puerto Rico, having known it now pretty closely for the past five years, you, and Anne said something also about real and authentic, you have something as a destination that gives people so many options to be there. They can be outside, they can explore, they can be beaches, they can look at history, they can look at all the elements that many destinations can't. So I, I think, uh, you know, when you continue to talk about the great things and communicate effectively what you do, uh, I just think we'll come back in a period of time. And I think you're really well poised as a destination to capitalize on what's occurred this past uh, 12, 15 months. And I think Don passed the ball over to you. So let's hear from Cleo. Will the cruise ship industry uh, say at some point the crisis is over? 
Well, um, I, I agree that there's not really a moment in time that the bell rings and everything's back to normal because uh, we don't know what the, the new normal is going to be. I really don't like that phrase, but we don't know what the future really holds and what it's going to be. What we are is agile and we have the ability to resume res um, operations responsibly. You know, I talked about staying the course when this started the first, there were four phases that we really looked at and we built, um, you know, an architecture of planning and messaging um, and, act, and actions um, that were described through that messaging that we would do. And those four phases were the response phase, the rebuilding phase, the reinvention phase, and the resumption of operations phase. We are now, I would say, um, in the beginning of the resumption of operations. So um, let's, just, let's just back up a little bit on this. The response phase is that time where you can't pay any attention to, to doing anything else than what is the right thing to do. You can't pay any attention to the, um, you know, the naysayers or the critical um, statements, or even the ones that are just completely wrong. Because as my crisis um, mentor told me once, the most important thing to do in the response phase is to, if it's stinking, burning, uh, exploding, um, shriveling, doing anything you don't like, that you have to pay attention. Attention. You have to take immediate action based on the evidence um, and the guidance and the direction of the authorities, whatever the authorities are. In this particular case, it's governments and health authorities. Um, and you have to make the decisions on a people first level, um, regardless of what other people are saying, even if people are saying you're not doing that. Uh, that's the most important thing. And it's your biggest investment. The next is the rebuilding phase. And this is a time when you can start to set the record straight. You can provide context and, um, you know, and, but it's also a very important place where you acknowledge more can be done. All of this builds up to when you can start to say that we're past the point of crisis. Um, I think we're always gonna be paying attention and being, having to deal with the issue or issues management um, in the aftermath of this pandemic um, and, and in any crisis for, as that, you know, for that matter. Um, but you then move into the reinvention phase. So you have to, you're, you're collaborating, you are validating your plan changes with authorities. It's science led in this particular case. Um, and the reinvention is about setting the foundation for resumption of operations. So I'd say, you know, I'm using the term resumption of operations as getting back to um, you know, what we ever we want to call as normal. Um, and that's um, in, in this particular phase, um, which we're in now, it's about providing evidence of reinvention to inspire trust and confidence. So whether it's confidence in the destinations or in this case, and for, for Clea's case, it's confidence in crews. This is very, very, very important. Um, and you've got to provide the tools and resources for other to, others to help tell that story and exude confidence because they're going to want to come back to your destination, come back to your hotel based on their experience and the experiences of others. So bringing forth the, um, you know, the chorus of voices and the power of partnerships to be able to get the word out um, consistently, credibly, and in a compelling way is very important. And then you get into resumption of operations. But one of the things that Puerto Rico has always done very, very well is that even throughout any portion of these particular phases and whatever, um, you know, you, you may call them different things, but it, they've always pivoted very quickly to always looking toward the future. Uh, that's been important. You don't want to get mired in the past. If you're doing the response phase correctly, you don't need to get mired in the past because you don't have to constantly go back and defend and defend and look back and rethink what you were doing. Um, so you have to support success by resuming your operations responsibly, saying when it's, um, you know, we know that we can't completely shut down travel for any particular destination. It will just decimate the economy. Travel is so important to the economy, but there's a way to do it responsibly. And part of that is communicating the plan um, providing frequent updates, uh, providing a phased in approach, and uh, the most important, inviting people to come back and experience the difference for themselves and to share it with others. So how do you know it's time? Um, there's not any one time. And what Don said is so incredibly important. People have their own level of risk and they will decide when it's time. You just have to create the groundwork, the planning and the communication to help them make that decision. We have just two minutes left. So very briefly, Vienna, does the hospitality industry have a bell to be rung and will it be rung? 
I think it's a new normal that we've entered. And again, I think that it's just so different. And again, Don's point on the fact that it is just so personal and it is so different one country to the next that it is just how we're gonna, this is a new normal of travel. And I think maybe some measures may be reduced, some may change, but I don't know that there's a, a belt to be run other than just seeing those great signs of the, the pent up travel demand and seeing so many people now in so many of our hotels, it's been great to see. And finally, the, the same question for Manuel and Peco from the perspective, obviously, of, of Puerto Rico as a destination. Well, I will say listen to go ahead, Manuel. I'm sorry, Jose. Um, resiliency has a new meaning uh, after COVID, right? And of, after all these disasters, uh, uh, but also needs to have a new purpose. And you need to connect that meaning and new purpose with the visitor's experience in the destination. And that translates into one thing from my perspective, which is progress. So when you show progress, regardless of whether at what stage you are in the crisis, whether you think that you're gonna be back to some normal or not, for me, that's gonna be very important. And you need to communicate that progress, market that progress, but that progress also needs to be real. So I remember back in Maria, people started visiting Puerto Rico in November and December, 2017. Even after Puerto Rico was still managing a lot of challenges, specifically, you know, electricity and, and telecommunications. Then six months later, a lot of those people went back. They came back and they saw progress. And that happened in 2018, that happened in 2019 and so forth. Now we have this new reality and resiliency has a new meaning, a new purpose and that progress needs to begin be communicated. I have a role in terms of making sure that, you know, all this, you know, infrastructure, whether it's electricity or whether there are roads and bridges, or where there is actual money to reconstruct recreational facilities, cultural facilities, or tourism uh, attraction facilities, they need to really make sure that there is progress. And I think that's going to tell the story. When, you know, people come now, they're going to enjoy a lot of the things that I think people are looking for after COVID or during COVID, which is outdoor activities. A lot of outdoor activities that we can do in Puerto Rico. Six months later, <clears throat> I can assure you that roads will be much better, that electricity will be better, and then there's going to be more, you know, inventory for those, you know, people looking to do outdoor activities and so forth. And then we'll do the same thing in a year and so forth. So that's probably my, my summary, my two cents, is that we need to ensure that we communicate and connect with that progress, and the progress needs to be real. Pego? Well, my, my answer was changed uh, uh, during this by listening to Don and, and the other uh, colleagues. Uh, and it goes back then to what I have been preaching today on behalf of Discovery Puerto Rico. Uh, we have to continue to share the data of the situation in Puerto Rico in terms of uh, uh, how many people have the virus and how, uh, how many people have been vaccinated and the improvement that we've done in, on the science field uh, when it comes related to COVID. So we need to continue to share the data and we need to be completely transparent with our locals and with the visitors and let them make the decision if they feel comfortable coming to Puerto Rico. So um, uh, use the data and communicate it in a transparent manner constantly. Thank you so much, Peco. And, and thank you. And thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today. Uh, it has been a very informative panel, and I know that uh, our attendees have enjoyed it very much. This uh, webinar, the complete video of the webinar, will be available on uh, Discover Puerto Rico's website uh, starting next week. So feel free to look it up. And again, thank you so much to our panelists and to our attendees and to Discover Puerto Rico for hosting this very informative webinar. Thank you very much and good day.